You may be seated in the Lord's presence. If you have your Bible with you, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. 1 Kings, chapter 19. And, you know, I know it's easy for us today to almost not be able to imagine an American which what we call racial equality is not normal. And, and fortunately, neither can our children imagine an America where that's not normal. But I want to take us back 50 years ago, because 50 years ago at this time, God was using a Baptist preacher. If you will recall, those of you that might have been alive at the time, basically using a Baptist preacher to call us back from descending into a second civil war. And that's the reality of the American experience. And in the southern states, they had laws that were called Jim Crow. It was, it was enforced racial segregation, ra racial segregation by ordinance. Here in Kansas City, neighborhood covenants were used to enforce the same thing. And even though they've been superseded now and trumped by federal law, many of them, many of those covenants are still in existence. You can, you can check them out for yourself. Barely 40 years ago, a family of color might drive down the south part of Truth. Look over at Fairyland Park. Fairyland Park was like the world's of fun of its day. They had, I don't know, the world's longest wooden roller coaster. And a child might say to his father, Daddy, why can't we go in there? And somehow, without hindering that child's view of himself, the father has to struggle to reply, probably using the operative term at the time, son, they don't allow Negroes in that park. One time a year we can go in there, Labor Day weekend, even then you are taunted and harassed by some of the other children. Now in the South, that meant separate motels or no motels. It meant separate restaurants or none. It meant separate water fountains, separate restrooms or none, separate schools but not equal. That marked the landscape of our moral landscape of our uh, times at that time. How do you make sense of a reality like that? How do you make sense of churches that would let you know, not in explicit terms, but in no uncertain terms, that your skin pigmentation caused it so that you could not be a member in good standing there? How do you explain that to a child? How do you even justify that to other saints well, we may get together with their kind in heaven, but on earth, they sit in the balcony, we sit in the pews. They stand at the back, we sit at the front. We eat at this lunch counter and drink at this water fountain and sit in this section, and they are separate from us because we aren't like them, meaning they're not as good as us. North and South. Black Americans were routinely denied accommodations, higher education, access to the polling place. Ever since the Tuskegee Airmen served in World War II, and then Harry Truman integrated the army by executive order in 1948. The obstructionist forces in Congress, in this case primarily Dixie Democratic senators, used the filibuster to block civil rights legislation at every turn. So 50 years ago this August, America was a bo boiling pot of social unrest. Civil rights leaders called for a march on Washington and as that event drew close, eyes focused on the final speaker. Our nation was torn by racial strife. We watched as a black Baptist preacher stood on the mall at the Lincoln Memorial and began to paint an indelible picture of America as it should be and America as it could be. Most Americans of the time recognized the name, face, and voice of Martin King. He led major protest movements in Montgomery, Birmingham, other places, and yet this black Baptist preacher was an enigma to many white Americans. What would Dr. King say? He arrived in Washington the day before. He prepared the speech in his hotel. Drew Hansen provides a parallel printing of Dr. King's manuscript that he prepared ahead of time and the actual words that he used. And interestingly enough, the most famous words he uttered are not included in his manuscript because what had happened was Mahalia Jackson, who was there that day, the queen of gospel, 
urged, she was sitting in the crowd and she urged him, Martin, tell him about the dream. So when he reached the climax of the moment, he simply departed from his prepared remarks and as any good Baptist preacher does, he stepped into sermonizing. His oratory soared, his imagery was vivid, his cause was right, the cadence, the inflection, the biblical allusions in his speech made it a memorable moment. The powerful argument he had about the moral arc of the universe gave the speech its weight. It now stands as much a part of the American national consciousness as Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Fifty years ago, we had a generation ready to reject the American dream of freedom and equality as a lie. They pointed out the hypocrisy in our democracy, how justice meant just for us, and how we were not yet a United States of America. Martin King challenged that generation to make the dream their own. So let's talk about dream work today, because it's easy to act Christian in here because it's all safe, and we can all hug each other. We can all love each other, but when, when you leave here today, when you go back out to your family or your neighborhood or your peer group, will you get intimidated again? We have only one chance to serve our generation. Whatever our fathers and mothers did not do, it is now our only chance to get this done. So if you're here and you're not asleep, I know just what you're saying, but Alan, look, there are no more marches. It seems like there's nothing left to be done or at least nothing on the scale of the past. So don't let me leave here till you tell me. What can I do today? What is the dream work we need to make the teamwork at this church? I'd be glad to help you out. Give me a minute to unpack some Bible principles from this passage. We'll clothe ourselves with their truth, get our healing, and head out of here. Ready to start this year with fresh vision, and then next Sunday with a new series about the absolute essentials of the Christian life. Because once we get saved, we owe something to God. So authentically humble souls want to lead others to God. Authentically humble souls want to grow and grow others in God. Authentically humble souls want to manage to the mission of mentorship. Authentically humble souls recognize in the words of Jesus in John 15 verse 16, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. He says, I'm willing to give you whatever you need. I'm willing to fill in every deficiency. I am willing to make up for any inadequacy. I want to overflow your life in competency. If you will just fulfill my mission through discipleship and bring fruit that will remain. That means every member of this church should be a minister. And every member should be a minister because every believer has been spiritually gifted. So check this. Let me hit you with this definition. Being spiritually gifted means you got something to give. You have something you can tell somebody. You have something you can share with somebody. You have something you can teach somebody about the faith. And as the hymn writer of old sang, if you cannot cross the ocean and the distant lands explore. You can find the lost around you. You can help them at your door. If you cannot speak like angels, if you cannot preach like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. You can say he died for all. Let none hear you idly saying there is nothing I can do. While the lost of earth are dying and the master calls for you, take the task he gives you gladly. Let his work your pleasure be. Answer quickly when he calls you, here am I. Send me. Send me. All I'm trying to say, and this is our thesis today, God has not left the vision of your life without a dream from his inerrant word and his ever-present spirit. Because every church has to be a disciple-making church in order to fulfill the Great Commission. And I didn't make that up. That's just the way it is from the Bible. I can tell you nothing less than what the Bible says. But I did know I was preaching here today, and you all are sophisticated, cultivated, educated crowds, so I knew I couldn't be no lazy preacher. I was going to have to go home and do my homework and just come correct, do my homework, and come back with something for you. So I did an etymological investigation of that word disciple. And you know what I discovered? Let me hit you with this definition. A disciple is someone who learns to be a follower so that he or she can grow to be a leader. 
Now, in business circles, they often use the word mentor, but mentor emerges from a character in Greek mythology. In Homer's ancient tale called the Odyssey, King Odysseus of Ithaca entrusts his only son, Telemachus, to the care and training of his friend, Mentor. And then the king goes off to war. Finally, the war is over. Troy has fallen, but it's been 10 years to get that done, and he's never returned to his kingdom. Certain rogues have overrun the palace. They pillaged his land. They were courting his wife, Penelope. Prince Telemachus wants desperately to get them out, but he doesn't have the confidence nor the experience to fight them. So the assignment given mentor is to prepare the king's son to rule and reign and represent So let me hit you with this definition. The relationship required of mentor was that of a full measure of wisdom, integrity, and personal investment with the goal of preparing the son to reign as as king. Prepare the son of the king to reign as king. And believe it or not, if you are born again, you are a king's son who was created to rule and to reign. We were made to have the blessings of Abraham. We were made to have the inheritance of Isaac. We were made to be an overcomer and not a victim. We were made to be a contributor and not just a caretaker. But to get out of you what God has placed in you, you you are going to have to have somebody else coach you. That is the purpose of discipleship. See, this is how God ensured that Christianity could never be successfully counterfeited. That's why there's no cookie cutter Jesus. That, so many things in the Christian life, ha, you have to see them worked in order to understand them. It has to be created and crafted in a way that it cannot be counterfeited. Okay, let me be kind and rewind. You can't get it just by reading about it. You can't get it just by coming on Sunday to sit, sleep, be seen, and leave. In order to really get it, you're going to have to watch somebody else doing it because here's our first point for study. Discipleship's not about transferring information. It is about communicating life. And this is where we miss it. This is where we lose the next generation. We have failed in positively affecting our community because we failed in our discipleship. Everybody needs to be discipled. Dr. Gardner Taylor said, the world does not take us Christians seriously because we do not take our discipleship seriously. Discipleship is the essential ingredient in living the Great Commission. So it's no surprise, as we tune into the telecast of our text today, 1 Kings 19, that this is a task that God also assigns to the prophet Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19, look with me in verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Okay, I'm going to tell you how to manage to be a mentor today, because we need a dream work that is going to make this team work. Anybody want to hear this? Just say, roll on, Rev. Rev. Okay, I'll even take silence as consent because it is just that important. So first off, notice if you will, there is no success if you don't have a successor. If everything you know dies with you, you lose. If your favorite recipe goes to the grave, you were a lousy cook. That's why Julia Julia Childs is so popular. She being dead yet cooketh because she put it into a book. So everything in you that's godly needs to be passed on to somebody else. I mean, if we can pin silly stuff to Pinterest, how come we can't pin serious stuff to disciples? Elijah was to find his disciple. What a price we pay today because the dream of discipleship has been diverted from the central act of our churches. Therefore, we live today in the most self-centered, self-focused, self-absorbed culture ever to walk this earth. Oh, you ain't going to talk to me after service today, but that's okay. Because this is why we have young people who won't listen and old folk who won't talk. Because when you do not get involved in biblical discipleship, you are sacrificing the next generation. Dr. King would have been 84 years old this month. He's gone now, but what dream did he die for? 
Our society is still today paying a dreadful price, the slow breakdown of the family. Ethics have gone out the window. Dignity has been lost. Our kids have been captured by a crass sense of materialism where bling becomes everything. And then they come to church and watch Christians who do just enough to get by and not enough to get done. Hello, somebody. Singles who are led by lust and not by love. What price are we paying? Because we have neglected the great commission's call to discipleship. And I don't care who you are, how big your Bible is, or how long you've been coming to church. No person in here can bring out their own potential. No one in here can be their own counselor, their own coach, their own instructor, because none of us can see our own blind spots. The dream work that makes the team work is everybody needs to be a disciple and then be a discipler. So can I take a teaching moment right here and give you a word that you didn't ask for? More time spent with purposeful people yields greater results. More of your time spent with purposeful people will yield greater insight. So then on the other hand, a fundamental part of the dream is this. Number two, get involved with with discipleship so that you can take the lessons of discipleship and watch people be changed by the insight that you will provide them through the scriptures. You cannot be coached in a crowd. That's why most discipleship in our church is done one-on-one. Now, you can be encouraged in a crowd. You can get excited in a crowd, but you cannot be coached in a crowd. That's why discipleship is such a critical component of evangelism, of assimilation, and of missions. Discipleship provides the mechanism by which new people feel like they fit, and they're made a part of us here. Discipleship becomes the place where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. Cheers. (laughs) Discipleship is a spot where you receive love, support, and care on a personal basis. Discipleship connects you in a small group family to this great big family. So Christianity turned the world upside down 20 centuries ago. Why? Because Jesus poured his life into 12 disciples, three of which he separated out to be with him a little bit closer. He preached to the masses, but he literally invested himself in just a few, knowing that the few would then invest themselves in others. I can see you don't believe me, so I'm going to read it to you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says, And the things that thou hast heard of me... Among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So let me tell you my dream. If you want to transform your life, if you want to transform your family, transform this church, transform the community, transform our society, then we have to be about the business of discipleship. The Elijah principle, pour your life into another prophet. So let me ask you a question that will help you see the dream. What will you leave behind whenever you're gone? I mean, other than bills, what will you leave behind? (laughs) Will your tombstone say, born a man, died a subcontractor? Maybe even born a woman, died a brain surgeon. Or will it say, born a man, died a discipler, and his children live on? If the question is, what will you leave behind? The answer is what you're investing in. And you better recognize there's a higher priority than cash, cars, and clothes because third, third, our priority is an urgency to invest in other people and thereby transform them by transferring to them the faith. Your faith transfers to their faith and transfers to them the hope, the values, the integrity, and the promises of Holy Scripture. So can I help somebody out with the dream today? Anybody who disciples you does so with a string attached. Dr. King spoke on the mall in Washington with a string attached. You came here and I'm preaching with a string attached. And that string is this. Just like Jesus ordained us when he chose us to get saved... I am now obligating you to turn around and disciple somebody else. The reason it worked on the mall is because they didn't let it die on the mall. So that 
what happened 48 years ago was preceded by what happened 50, but if it had died 50 years ago, nothing would have happened in 65. I don't, even, I don't know why it took us 100 years anyway from 1865 to 1965, but I'm just saying it wouldn't have ever got there if it had died on the mall. Only two eternal things are on this planet right now. They are the written word of God, the Bible, and the souls of men and women. Help me, Holy Spirit, because here's our second point for study. The only thing we will be rewarded for at the judgment seat of Christ is what we did in ministry. I mean, what did you think you were going to get crowns for? Ministry is taking the Bible and putting it into people. Oh, you may build great cathedrals, large or small. You can build skyscrapers, grand and tall. You may conquer all the failures of the past, but only what you do for Christ will last. The only thing that's going to follow you out of time and into eternity is not your stuff in the world, but your ministry in the word. So you need to be strong enough. You need to become spiritual enough. You need to be wise enough to submit yourself to a formal structure for discipleship so that you can get a mentor that will make you matter in ministry. We need a mortal model of ministerial meaning manifested in our midst because the fourth element of our dream work is this. We all need a discipler whose life is an extension, expression, and expansion of the life, mood, movement, and mercy of our master. So slip on your swimming trunks with me. Let's dive into this text together. We need to answer this morning before we leave a two-fold question because I gotta get, I gotta get concrete with you regarding the dream. First, how do I find a discipler who matters? Second, how can I become a mattering disciple? So first, finding a biblical discipler, letter A. A biblical discipler will go where the disciple is. Watch, verse 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shaphat. Never forget that the faith we have is a going faith. Jesus told you in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, we're to make disciples of all nations first by going. We keep telling people to come. God tells us to go. So let me see if I can illustrate this irrefutable idea. E.K. Bailey, late pastor of Concord Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, said the problem with the modern church is we never break out of the huddle. We're like a football team that never comes out of the huddle. And if you never come out of the huddle, you, can't, you can never run the ball. You, you can, and if you never run the ball, you can never win the game. That is how Satan has gotten over on us. We need to be willing to go where they are at. Evangelism is the energy that drives our discipleship. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, go. Okay, wait, that was the wrong one. Turn to the other one and say, go. (laughs) Go into lives that have been abandoned and bring life. Go into communities that are suffering and bring light. Go into workplaces that are corrupt and bring salt. Go into teenagers smelling themselves and struggling and guide them. Go to couples fighting to stay together and be a counselor. Go and then as you go, Jesus promises to be with you always because God wants us to go. And don't go stand above them and judge them and demand that they come up where you are before you move. No, get down with them, stand beside them. Show them how to apply Bible principles and help them get up with you. A biblical discipler has to come where we are. And then second, a biblical discipler will come with an anointing. So here's a dream work question for you. I know why you're going, but what are you coming with? Could I get just 23 of you to shout anointing? Anointing. Now, can I take a teaching moment right here? Because the practice of anointing people with oil was a way to visualize the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in somebody's life. So let me hit you with this definition. When you're anointed in scriptural tradition, it signifies power bestowed and authority given. Oil in Afro-Semitic cultures carried the image of comfort and prosperity and nourishment. Oil represents great gladness, tremendous joy, as well as being a type or picture of the Holy Spirit in the believer. To anoint someone was to consecrate and dedicate and set them aside for sacred use. So Elijah's to anoint Elisha, and that communicates that God is now ready to use Elisha in a greater way for God's glory. That is the dream. And that's the sense that you have to give somebody else when you disciple them. 
Verse 19, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12. So Elisha already had gifts, talents, and skills, and abilities. But those things were ineffective without an anointing. Okay, let me break it down. You need to yield whatever you have to the ministry of Almighty God. You got to get this in your head. You got to see it in your head in order to get it in your spirit today because this is how God wants to work in your life. If you want the Spirit's power, you have to acknowledge His presence. So God, God will uh, take our responsiveness to the Spirit and use it by anointing us. And God's anointing on our lives for the purpose of discipleship will be so fluid, so abundant, it will become part of us. We will be drenched in the Word of God. We will be saturated with the presence of God. That is the dream that I have. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I ain't playing church. I'm too old to play church. I'm too old to have church. I want to be so full of the Holy Spirit that when a mosquito bites me, he leaves my arms singing, there's power in the blood. (laughs) That is the kind and the caliber of disciple you want to be. Verse 19, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. First, go where they are and reach them. Second, go with anointing and help them. Thirdly, if you want to be a biblical discipler, a biblical discipler will have something to offer. There must be a curriculum to complete us. You you have to have something to communicate. And I just helped about a hundred of you in here understand why you haven't been discipling yet. You need a coach that has a curriculum. You need somebody who's not with you for what they can get out of you, but someone who is looking to complete you spiritually. Elijah didn't come empty-handed, he had a cloak in his hand. Now let me hit you with this definition, because that word translated mantle simply means something ample, something more than sufficient without being excessive. It is a symbol of God's sufficiency for the task at hand, a symbol of God's supply for the mission he's called us to accomplish. And I wish I could preach right there, but I'm holding you too long. So the question from the pulpit today is this, how do you find a discipler that matters... But secondly, how do you become a a mattering discipler? Okay, it's real simple. A, B, C, and we're all free. First, letter A. Listen for God's voice on behalf of your disciple. Be careful who has your ear. Because, not uh, you know, everybody talking to you is not always for you. Some people have the wrong agenda for you, and that's why discipleship is so important. Okay, watch. Move back up to verse 13. Verse 13. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out, stood in the entering into the cave. Behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? I know you can hear the polarizing rhetoric of the politicians, but can you hear God? I know you can hear the crippling conversations of everybody critiquing you, but do you hear God? I know you can hear the distorted declarations of the media who want to shape you into their materialistic slave, but do you hear God? So the first step to becoming a disciple that matters is learning to listen to God so you can pass on what he says. But secondly, secondly, let her be accept the watch care of the person you disciple. Samuel was the last judge before the appearance of kings in Israel, and he was the most spiritual judge Israel ever had. In describing his role to the nation, in 1 Samuel 12, Samuel said in verse 23, Moreover is for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. That is the dream. That is discipleship right there in the Old Testament. Samuel said to the people, I've accepted the watch care of you as your spiritual mentor. That means I will pray and I will teach. You plan and prepare for your teaching. You you put your personality into the lessons, the 16 discipleship lessons we have. You add personal illustrations. You look for cross-references as you read through Scripture on your own. And then when you meet with someone over those lessons, you can disciple them. Let me lift the shade on the window of your apathy. You're a biblical discipler when God assigns you to take what you learn and bless somebody else with it. Elijah, share with Elisha some of what I've given to you. 
That's why it's never enough to attend church. You have to attempt at church because here's our third point for study. What you get out of God is in direct relationship to what you are doing for God. Oh, Sham and Alaranda should have bought a Honda. I'll speak in tongues at that one because the quickest way to get disconnected, dis- detached, discouraged, and depressed is to sit around doing nothing. So God comforts Elijah by connecting him to a concrete assignment. But in the final analysis, the dream work that will make our team work and becoming a discipler that matters means we not only listen to God's voice, we not only accept a person's watch care, but third, let her see, we must follow the instructions to be a disciple. Verse 20, and he left the oxen, ran after Elijah, said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And Elijah said unto him, go back again for what I've done unto thee. In other words, go ahead, I'm not stopping you. Elisha says, with your permission, I want to go communicate to my parents what God is doing in my life. So he ties up his loose ends. Then he immediately puts himself under Elijah's authority. Now listen, because if you're going to catch the mantle, you're going to have to be willing to let something else go. If you're going to see the dream, you're going to have to shut your eyes to something else. Let me open a window on that word because as a child, Martin King was attracted to words and people who spoke eloquently. His father once said, if he heard that some outstanding man was going to speak, he'd ask me to take him. I remember one time when he was only about 10, he said, that man had some big words, daddy. When I grow up, I'm going to get me some big words. So as soon as he could read, he lived in dictionaries and he made that statement come true. King was obsessed with good preachers. Well-known ministers with graceful styles were constantly visitors, not only in his father's Auburn Avenue Baptist Church, but in their household. That included Sandy Ray, Joseph Jackson, Benjamin Mays, Gardner Taylor, Howard Thurman. Prior to the Civil Rights Movement, he would spend 15 hours to prepare each sermon. So on Tuesday, he'd start outlining his ideas. On Wednesday, he'd conduct research and gather illustrations. On Friday, he'd start to write the sermon. On Saturday, he'd complete it. Martin King once said, on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it expedient? Then expedience comes along and asks the question, is it politic? And vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? So King shut his eyes to some things to become proficient in the all-important thing. Elisha could not become a great prophet by hanging out with oxen anymore. Elisha could never become a great prophet by plowing with the servants anymore. you got to move when the mantle falls. And it's, it's fallen on you today, so you need to start moving. Verse 21, and he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the auction and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. If you want to arrive at God's purpose for your life, you have to dream. You have to see yourself in a discipleship process. Every member of Christ's body is to be involved in ministry because we provide the touch, the human touch, that makes the word of God real in the lives of people. God is consistent, God is concerned, God is every day about his business of discipleship. And I know this may sound like castor oil preaching today. It may, taste, may not taste good, but it will help you work some things out. Every head bowed, every eye closed, every Christian, please pray.